Welcome to Math with Mrs. Bibb. Today we will discuss functions and continuity, linearity, intercepts, and symmetry. If you will please take the time right now to write down um, the definitions I'll highlight for you. Write down what domain is. Also write down what function is. So function, domain, codomain, range. So write those in your notes. You do not have to write word for word. You're welcome to write word for word, but you may paraphrase. Do make sure to include this about the codomain. That's very, very important to know. So you can pause the video and write down those definitions. If you will please also write down the definition for a one-to-one -one function and an on-to function. We'll do some examples together in class. You're welcome to leave space there, a um, couple lines, three lines, to um, write down some examples for those. You can pause the video and write those definitions. Here, this is the same graph, so if you would draw one graph and then we'll discuss the different ways that you will represent domain, range, and the codomain. So when I look at this graph, the domain is the set of x values. And so you can see that this graph is going from negative infinity to positive infinity for my domain. And again, you do not have to draw this, you don't have to draw this. The domain is in red. The range I will do in green. The range is your set of y values. So as you can see, this graph, there's y values associated with all of these. So it goes from um, zero to the negative numbers. So your range is y is less than or equal to zero. That's how you would write that in. Um, when you were in Algebra 1. In Algebra 2, we write that in interval notation, and that interval notation would start from the smallest number, which would be negative infinity, which always has a parenthesis, to the largest number on the graph, which is 0 here, and 0 is included, so you put a bracket. If it's excluded, you put a parenthesis. Another way to look at it, if it's solid, it's included. If it's open or dotted, then it's excluded. And then the codomain, the codomain, if you wrote down in your definition, the codomain is, I'm going to write that down here, all real numbers unless otherwise noted. So they have not stipulated here what the codomain is. So it's understood to be all real numbers. And I did not write that for my range yet either. So all real numbers is what we would write in Algebra 1. But in Algebra 2, we're going to use negative infinity to positive infinity for um, all real numbers. That's my interval notation, negative infinity to positive infinity. And that means the codomain is negative infinity to positive infinity because it is not otherwise stated. So that's discussing domain and range and the codomain. So it says we can use various notations, and I just mentioned interval notation, set builder notation, and algebraic notation. They're all concise ways. Now I'm going to show you all three. I'll start with algebraic notation. So let's say 
that this is x, because we'll pretend like this is the x-axis. This is x is less than 2. That's your algebraic notation. Your interval notation. Reading your number line from left to right, from negative infinity to positive infinity. Where does your black number line start being shaded blue? Well, it's blue here at negative infinity, and negative infinity gets a parenthesis. It stops being blue at 2, and 2 is excluded, so it gets a parenthesis also. So this is your interval notation. Your set builder notation looks like this. You have the set notation. It's from x, x such that, so that vertical bar is read such that, and you just put the algebraic notation in the set. So x such that x is less than 2. That is set builder notation. So please make sure you have all of those written down. We just discussed part A um, right before we did the interval notation, algebraic notation, and set builder notation. So this part B wants us to, to determine if this function is on 2. So first let's talk about is it 1 to 1, and I'll talk while I write the domain and the range. Um, to be 1 to 1, remember it has to pass the horizontal line test. And if I did not say that earlier, I don't think I did. But to be 1 to 1, it has to pass the horizontal line test. No y value can repeat. And to be an on 2 function, then your codomain and your range must be the same. And so we discussed earlier the domain, the range, and then I pointed out that the codomain would have to be all real numbers because it wasn't limited. So is this a one-to-one -one function? Does it pass the horizontal line test? No, it does not. It would fail the horizontal line test right here. And remember, we went, we didn't draw these. And then, is it an on two function? Well, an on two function has to have this to be true. Your domain, excuse me, your range and your codomain have to be the same. Are my range and my codomain the same? No, they are not. So it is neither one to one or one to. Here are some examples to identify one to one and on to functions. For the first one, it tells us our codomain is all real numbers. For the second one, it tells us our codomain, it's listed in set builder notation, y such that y is less than or equal to four but I want us to use interval notation. So that's from negative infinity to four, including four. And then the codomain for the last one is all real numbers. So domain, I do just want to go through the domain even though I don't need domain for uh, to figure out if it's an on to function. But let's go through the domain quickly. The domain here the x, how far left or right does this graph go? And hopefully you see that it goes forever to the left and to the right. So that domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. The domain of the second one, thinking about those x values, is there an x value everywhere on this parabola? And keep in mind that a parabola is slowly opening outward. And so yes, the domain would be um, all real numbers because there is a an x value that will match all of the x values 
on the x-axis. So my domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. And then the domain of this linear function. So this is an exponential function. I'm going back. This one's exponential. This one's quadratic, specifically a parabola. And this one's linear. So those are things that you're going to have to know. So I like to repeat them often. And as we look at the x-axis for domain, is there a value if I go way down here? Will there be a value on that line? Yes, and here, and here. So yes, the domain is all real numbers there, written as negative infinity to positive infinity. Now the range is what's going to help us decide if we have an on to function. Don't forget that. The range is going to help us to, to decide that. So my range, this graph, is approaching zero. Now it does look, look like it crosses it, but it does not being an exponential function. So it approaches zero, but it doesn't cross it. Y is greater than zero. That's an algebraic notation. So an interval notation with, for Y is greater than zero, it doesn't touch zero, but it approaches zero. That's my smallest number. And it goes to positive infinity. And then my range for the second one the largest y value is here at 4, and it comes from, let me get a highlighter, it comes from negative infinity and goes to 4. So that is my range, negative infinity to 4. And 4 is included, so you get a bracket. And then my range for the last one. Is there a y value that would go with every single um, y value on that blue line? And yes, there is. So that domain is all real numbers, which is negative infinity to positive infinity. Now let's decide if this is a one-to-one -one function. And then we'll decide if it's an on-to function. Okay, so one-to-one -one has to pass the horizontal line test. This first one, we'll call this letter A, because that's confusing. Letter B, letter C. So letter A would pass the vertical, oh, excuse me, the horizontal line test. So yes, it's a one-to-one -one function. Letter B would fail the horizontal line test, so no, it's not a one-to-one -one function. And letter C would pass the horizontal line test so yes, it is a one-to-one -one function. Oh, I'm just going to write yes. Sorry about that. Let me get an eraser. Okay, is it on two? So remember, to be an on two function, the do the codomain and the range have to be the same. Are those two things the same? No. So it's not an on two function. So for letter B, the second one is the range and the codomain the same? That answer is yes. So that is an on two function. And then for the last one, is the range and the codomain the same? And that's a yes. So yes, it's an on two function. So that's how you tell the difference between one to one and on two. Please read the first paragraph about discrete, con dis discrete continuous or functions that are neither of those. And then write down the definition for a continuous function and a discrete function. You do not have to write down the definition for a discontinuous function. But write down the definition for both of those, please. Pause the video if you need to. If you will please draw those three examples, write down some form of the instructions. So, I mean, you could write, um, I'll grab a red highlighter. You could write discrete, continuous, or neither with a question mark. And then domain and range with a question mark. So I've got to do all of that. I'm gonna make note down here at the bottom. 
So if you need to, pause the video and draw these three pictures. They do not have to be perfect. Just sketch them on your paper and then answer the questions. So let's go through and see if they're discrete, continuous, or neither. So looking at letter A, definition of continuous is a curve or a line that is not broken. And that definitely fits this function. So letter A is continuous. Letter B, it appears to be continuous, but it has what's called a hole, a hole in the graph. And when it has a hole, then it's neither discrete nor continuous because you can't have a hole there. And then letter C, I just have ordered pairs plotted, never connect your dots. I just have ordered pairs plotted, so that means this is a discrete function. Okay, then we're going to state the domain and the range for each of these. I'm going to use green for the x-axis and yellow for the y-axis. I want to do the easiest domain and range first, and some of you may need to, to write the ordered pairs, but I'm just going to go through like this, and I'm going to go from smallest to largest. Since this is discrete, the domain is just a list of ordered pairs, so I'm going to go to the um, smallest x value, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. So negative 3 is an x value, negative 2, negative 1. don't have any at zero. I do have one at one and one at three. And I almost missed one, this one, one at four. So I don't have any at zero. I have one at one, one at three, and one at four. If it would help you go through and write these ordered pairs first, this is negative one, negative two, negative three, negative three, one, two, three, four, negative three, four. So if you need to, go through and write those order pairs. This one is negative 2, negative 2. And negative 1, 3. And 1, 1. And 1, 2, 3, 2. And 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 3. So that may help you for your set of x and your set of y. And so my set of y values are smallest to largest would be negative 3, negative 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. So negative 3, negative 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's the domain and range of letter C. Okay, for letter A, the domain. When I look at this green, the x-axis that's green, I can see that this graph or this curve is going to open slowly forever to the left and forever to the right. So I know that every x value would be up here on this graph all the way to the left and all the way to the right. There would be an ordered pair that have an, has an x value on this curve. Let me get my pointer here. So on this curve, as it opens slowly, there's going to be an x value everywhere that would correspond and land on that graph. So then that means that my domain is all real numbers. How about the range? Would that be true for the range as well? If this graph is going up forever and down forever, would there be a y value that would be on an ordered pair on this graph? And that answer is yes. So my range is from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now let's look at the next one. It appears because 
I have arrows on the ends, that this graph's domain and range would both be negative infinity to positive infinity. However, this hole, this hole is at the ordered pair 1, 2, 1. So 2, 1 is where the hole's at. 2, 1. That means all my x's, so all the x's, but I wouldn't write this because we're going to write it in interval notation. All x's except 2. Now how that is written in interval notation. Your domain is from negative infinity to 2, excluding the 2. So there's a parenthesis. Union 2 to positive infinity. So that is a union here. And that, just simply writing it that way, excludes that 2 from my domain. So my range is all y's except, so all real numbers, except 1. So we would write our range the same way. From negative infinity to 1, union 1 to positive infinity. And that would be my answer. the range. For this next one, if you will please write this chart on your paper, and then you can write discrete, continuous, or neither with a question mark. So you could write discrete, continuous, or neither with a question mark. And then you can write domain and range with a question mark. Okay, so let's think about this graph, and you're welcome to pause after writing that information down. If I were to graph this up to two pounds, my cost is $8 a pound. And then specifically at 2.5, it's $20 a pound. At 3.5, three pounds, it's $22. At five pounds, it's $35. And I, I said something incorrectly back here. If you purchase two and a half pounds, it is $20, not, up, it could be $20. It is $20. Now, if you think about this, in this area here, this is continuous, because it would be based on how many pounds you have. But then it becomes discrete um, at 2.5 because 2.5 pounds will cost $20. And 3 pounds will cost $22. And 5 pounds will cost $35. So then that part is discrete and the first part is continuous. So it has to be all or nothing. So this one is neither discrete nor continuous. Now the domain and range is tricky on this one. I'm not going to write it in interval notation because of how tricky it is. Um, for my domain, there's two different, really like three different parts to it. For x is from zero, which zero would be, wouldn't include zero because if you bought zero, you have nothing less than or equal to two. Those are my x's. But also my x's are 2.5, 3, and 5. So that domain is very confusing, and I apologize for that, but that's something our textbook gave us, and I wanted to, to discuss that. And then for our range, our range is... Um, y is less than or equal to, well, I guess, 0 from 0. And I just looked at the textbook. They have equal to, but I guess you can spend $0. So y is greater than or equal to 0 to y is less than or equal to 8. That would be the first part, not 8. I'm so sorry. Why is that not eight? At eight dollars, you're talking about two pounds at eight dollars. Eight dollars a pound, that's 16. 
sorry about that. And then my other numbers that go with Y are 20, 22, and 35. So we're, we are combining, or this real world example combined continuous parts with discrete parts. But remember to look at it this way. Up to two pounds is $8 per pound. So one pound would be $8. One and a half pounds would be $12. Two pounds would be $16. And then after that, these are your prices. Two and a half pounds is $20, so on and so forth. So that's that example. As we look at this quadratic function, remember specifically it is a parabola, then we want to name the domain in the range in set builder and interval notation. So if you'll please draw that on your paper. And we will name the domain. Remember the domain is from left to right. And these parabolas are opening slowly forever to the left and forever to the right. So the domain here is in interval notation negative infinity to positive infinity. In set builder notation, that domain is written like this, and I'm sure you've seen this before, but set builder has this um, set notation, this brace, read x such that, this vertical bar such that, x is an element of, so this symbol e is an element of the set of real numbers. Now sometimes I make a fancy R, like the one in the textbook looks something like this. I'm not very good at drawing that, but it's like a fancy block style letter R. That, that's how you write all the real numbers, X such that X is an element of any of the real numbers. And then for my range, remember that's your Y values. You're looking at your y-axis. Pay close attention to the fact that on this y-axis, there's no blue graph down here. So it does not have any elements that are less than negative six. So that means when you look at this, and let me get rid of that scribble really quickly. Let me undo or erase, whichever one comes first. There we go. So you can tell, hopefully, that negative 6 is this lowest point. And so it starts at negative 6. It includes negative 6. So when it includes, you put a bracket. It includes negative 6. And it goes to positive infinity for my um, range. And that written in set builder notation y such that y is greater than or equal to negative 6. So again, this one is interval notation. And this one is called set builder notation. On to the next slide. So state the domain and range in, of each function in set builder and interval notation. So let's do the domain first of each of these. Domain is how far left or right. How far left or right. How far left or right. And hopefully you can recognize that both of these, their domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity. From negative infinity to positive infinity. This graph of this curve, these arrows are slowly opening to the left and slowly opening to the right. Please do um, write down or sketch both of these graphs on your paper and do this problem as well. So that one's interval notation and now I'll do set builder. So all real numbers in set builder notation is written this way x such that x is an element of the set of real numbers. 
And that one looks pretty good. And same thing over here. Let me divide these. X such that X is an element of the set of real numbers. Not bad. Not bad. Okay, and then the range. The range for the one on the left. Remember, we're talking about your Y values. And hopefully you see that the highest Y value, this ordered pair is negative 1, 1, 2, 3. And this ordered pair is positive 1, 1, 2, 3. So the highest Y value we have, whoopsie. highest y value I have is 3. So that means my graph is coming from negative infinity. Always put your smallest number first. From negative infinity, positive, in, positive infinity and negative infinity both have um, a parenthesis, a comma, and it goes to the largest y value of 3. And 3 is included. And then in set builder notation, y such that y is less than or equal to positive 3. That's set builder notation. And then as I look at this linear function, I notice that it is going forever. Hold on, I thought I was on a highlighter. Forever up and forever down. So that means that my range is the same as the domain here, negative infinity to positive infinity, and in set builder notation, y such that y is an element of the set of real numbers. Oh, I didn't close this one. Oops. Make sure you close yours. And that would be those two examples. Okay, now this one is tricky. This, this, please sketch this on your paper. This is called a piecewise function. And hopefully you saw these in Algebra 1. You may not have, so we'll discuss them. It's called a piecewise function because it has two pieces. And this first piece that's on the left has an ordered pair of negative 1, negative 1. That's where that piece ends, it comes from um, the bottom of the graph up to negative 1, 1. And then 0, 1, 2 is where the second piece starts. So our domain Looking at the first piece, I call this one the first piece and this one the second piece. Looking at our first piece, I can see that my x values, oh, let me highlight in green, my x values start at negative 1 and go forever this way, and then also start at negative, or part, sorry, at 0 and go this way. So in set builder notation, I'll do that one first, it is x such that x is piece 1, x is less than negative 1. And it's less than because this is an open circle. And then I put or, for the second piece, x is greater than or equal to, and x is greater than or equal to 0. That's my set builder notation. In interval notation, I would have... Um, from, and think about this, from negative infinity, because that's where this is coming from, to negative 1. From negative infinity to negative 1. Negative 1 is excluded, so you put a parenthesis. So don't forget, that's excluded. Union, 0, which is solid, so it's included, to positive infinity. And it closes with a parenthesis.
and then let's do the range. So my range, as I look at it, I grab my yellow or green, yeah, my yellow highlighter. It starts here and goes forever up and starts here and goes forever down. So let's do the set builder first. So Y such that Y is less than negative one or my Y value here is two. Y is greater than or equal to two. And then in interval notation, we're coming from negative infinity and we stop at negative one. So from negative infinity to negative one with a parenthesis, because this is open, union from two, and I put a bracket because it's closed, a closed circle, to positive infinity. So again, this is interval notation. And this is um, set builder notation. Next, a linear function. So please define that on your paper. A linear function has no variable raised to a power other than one. It can be written in this form, so make sure you write that down. So define it. There's your definition. It can be written in this form where m and b are real numbers. Linear functions can be represented by linear equations, which are written in the form ax plus by equals c. Now, it does not say that there, but this is called standard form. I wonder if they're going away from that definition, but that's called standard form. And then I think this just makes perfect sense. The graph of a linear equation, make sure you write this, is a straight line, always. A straight line. So make sure you write down those definitions. Here's some more definitions. A function that's not linear is nonlinear, so that makes sense. The graph of a function includes a set of points that cannot all lie on the same line, and the function is nonlinear. So just write that first part. A function that is not linear is called a nonlinear function, um, which this makes sense. A nonlinear function cannot be written in the form f of x equals ax plus b. You do not have to write that. Please do define a parabola is the graph of a quadratic function, which is a type of nonlinear function. So you do need that as well. So you need this and this, and the rest of that you just need to read. Determine whether each function is a linear function and justify your answer. So we said that it has no exponent other than one. So as I look at this, this one has an exponent other than one. So this one is not linear. And this one could be rewritten as six X divided by three minus five divided by three. And so this would be a linear function because it can be written in that form, um, f of x equals mx plus b. Make sure you write these examples down. Another thing it didn't mention over there, to be linear, there's no exponent other than one. There's also no variables in the denominator. That's not linear. You can have a number in the denominator, but no variables in the denominator. Also, no variables can be under a radical. I'll show you what I mean. So please make sure you write all that down. You cannot have the square root of x or the square root of any number. So make sure to be linear, you can't have any of these things here. Determine whether each graph represents a linear or nonlinear function. Please draw those two graphs. They do not have to be perfect, I promise. Just sketch them, and this letter A is nonlinear because it does not form a straight, perfect line. 
even though this is a straight line, to be linear, it has to keep going. This, it, since it goes this way, it is not linear. And then the other one, is that a perfect straight line? Yes, it is. So this one is linear. So draw those on your paper and write down linear and nonlinear. And we should know the answer to this if you'll please write down that question. Why is f of x equals the square root of 2x plus 3 not a linear function? You can write the explanation that um, x is under a radical, but I want to show you mathematically why. You should have learned, and it doesn't should have doesn't necessarily mean you did, you should have learned in Algebra 1 that the square root means you have an exponent of 1 half. And so please do write this down for me because you need to remember that square root means you have an exponent of 1 half. And since you have an exponent that's not a whole number, that's not 1, this is not linear. So I'm going to write because um, the exponent is not 1. That's why it's not a linear function. If you'll pause the video, please, and read this problem, and then we'll discuss it in just a moment. To answer the first question, are her weekly earnings modeled by a linear or nonlinear function? You could make a graph. Week one was about $85, or was $85. Week two, um, let's make this 100. So that would be 119. Week 3, let's make this 150. So that would be 153. Week 4, 187. So let's make this 200 and week 5 about there now mine doesn't look very good but I'm certain that like this dot is off some so I would say that it is a linear function And it says our negative or x, y values, our negative x or y values possible in the context of the situation. And the answer to that would be no. Negative values are not possible because. The employer needs to pay her, not vice versa. So that's why it would be considered a linear function and you couldn't have any negative x values. On to the next problem. Please make sure to write down this vocabulary. A point on the, at which the graph intersects the axis is called an intercept. Oops. An intercept. Define x-intercept, please. And define y-intercept, please. So pause and define those. And please make a note that a linear function has at most one x-intercept, while a nonlinear function may have more than one x-intercept. And it says no function will have more than one y-intercept. So please make mental and physical note of that. Use the graph to estimate the intercepts. I'm looking for the x-intercept and the y-intercept. 
So it looks like this graph crosses both axes there at 0, 0. So I would say the x-intercept is 0 and the y-intercept is 0. If you want to write it as an ordered pair, then you would say 0, 0 for both of them. x-intercept is this. This will always be 0. The y-intercept, the y-intercept is this, and this will always be 0 in the y-intercept. So please write that down. Sketch that graph. Just a rough sketch is fine. Estimate the x and the y-intercepts. Okay, so x-intercepts I will highlight in yellow where it crosses the x-axis crosses or touches, and then the y-intercept I'll highlight in red. So let's write those down. The x-intercepts, please sketch that graph. The x-intercepts appear to be negative 3, negative 1, and 2. And the y-intercept, there's only one. The y-intercept looks like it's um, 4, 8, 12, 16, we're going by fours here. The y-intercept looks like it's at 12. And reading this, think about it. It says, can the graph have more than one y-intercept? And the answer is no. We just read that and wrote that down. Please draw these graphs on your paper and write the instructions. And now we'll find the x-intercepts. I think the first thing that I would do is I would look at the x-axis and see where those graphs cross the x-axis. And then I would look at the y-axis and see where those graphs cross the y-axis. That would help me know what the x-intercepts are and the y-intercepts are. The next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to write the ordered pairs for each of these, my green dot for letter A is at negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, negative 5, 0. My yellow dot for letter A is at 0, 2. My green dots for letter B are at negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 4, 0, negative 2, 0. 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 3, 0, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 0. And now I can name the x-intercepts. Now some teachers will say that you need to list the ordered pair, but to, for me, I just say that you list that one number, the x-intercept or x-intercepts for letter A, just negative 5. If you list the ordered pair, that is not incorrect. Negative 5, 0 is the ordered pair for the x-intercepts. But the x-intercept is just negative 5. And then the y-intercept is positive 2. For letter B, the x-intercepts are negative 4, negative 2, 0, 3, and 5. And the y-intercept, I only have one, and that is 0. Right here, the y-intercept is 0. If you will read this problem and draw this chart on your paper, it doesn't have to be fancy, just draw it on your paper, and then we will do letter A and letter B. When you write down letter A, I would just write X and Y intercepts and put a question mark. Remember, the X intercept is where Y equals 0, and the Y intercept is where X equals 0. So I'll use green again. Green is where Y equals 0, that's my X intercept. Where Y equals 0, that's my X intercept. Do I have any other ones? No. And then my Y intercept is where x equals 0, and here's where x equals 0. So that means that my 
x-intercept is 8. And my y-intercept is 15. And then it says, what is the meaning of the intercepts in the context of the rocket's flight? So you could just say meaning with a question mark. And the meaning of that, um, the meaning of the x-intercept. So we're talking about a rocket flying. A rocket starts from a balcony. So here we have a balcony. A rocket starts here and it's flying through the air and then it's going to land. And it says the table shows the height of the rocket after each second. So for the x-intercept, and that's the green, after eight seconds, the rocket hits the ground. Here's why you know that. This is the height of the rocket during the flight. If it has a height of zero, that means it has landed on the ground. This is zero feet from the ground. And then my y-intercept the 0, 15, that means that this balcony is 15 feet in the air. The balcony the rocket was launched from is 15 feet in the air or above the ground. I'm going to write that. Sorry about that. Let me find my eraser. Oh. Fifteen feet above the ground. So this is zero fifteen, and this is eight zero. Describe the domain. The domain would be from zero to eight. So from zero seconds to eight seconds, that would be our domain. Next, we're going to discuss symmetry. If you will please make sure to write this definition and let's see a graph has line symmetry if it can be reflected in a vertical line so that each half of the graph maps exactly to the other half okay so do write that definition the line okay the line dividing the graph is called the line of symmetry so yes please make sure to write that as well each point on one side is reflected in the line to a point equidistant from the line on the opposite side. For example, zero, zero, this is the line of symmetry. So you are going to want to draw this figure. And it has line symmetry because negative one, negative two, negative three, two. Negative three, two, that's point A, and then what they would call A prime is at 1, 2. So those Y values are the same. Whoops, so sorry. Those Y values are the same. That's how you know it has a symmetry there. And a figure has symmetry. We should write that definition as well. A figure has symmetry. If there exists a rigid motion, reflection, translation, rotation, or glide reflection that maps the figure onto itself. So please make sure to include that definition. 
Then the next definition is point symmetry. A graph has point symmetry when it is rotated 180 degrees about a point and maps onto itself. And then the point of symmetry is that point in which the graph is rotated. So if you look at this picture here, I would definitely draw this picture. Zero, zero is our point of symmetry. And if you look at the ordered pair, negative one, negative two, it maps to the point positive one, positive two. Make notice, make sure you see that negative one, these are opposites, and negative two, positive two, those are opposites. That would be the point of symmetry. Your X and your Y values are going to be opposites of each other. So make sure to write down those definitions. Next, we'll discuss even and odd functions. So do write that down. Functions that have line symmetry are even functions. So that line symmetry is um, your Y and the opposite of Y. The X's will be different, but your Y's will be the same, but one positive, one negative. So this is Y, and this is the opposite of Y. So for example, if this were two, this order pair over here, um, sorry, uh, two, zero, then this order pair would be negative two, zero. This would have line symmetry because the f of x and the f of negative x. That's an even function. It has a line symmetry. Okay, odd functions have point symmetry. And I said in the previous slide when I talked about point symmetry, your y values are going to be opposites of one another. One will be negative, one will be positive. So don't forget that your y values and your x values will be opposite of each other. So y and x will be opposite of each other. That's point symmetry. And as I look at this, identify the type of symmetry in the graph of each function below. So let's look. For this first one, we have point symmetry. If you uh, rotate this thing, about any point, it's going to be the original graph. So, for example, if I rotate, rotated this 180 degrees, it's going to be that original graph. So this one has point symmetry, as this says, so make sure you write that down. And then when you look at this graph, this one has line symmetry, about this line x equals negative 2, because we have this line of symmetry that cuts this parabola in half. If you look at letter C, it says there's no symmetry because there's no line or point of symmetry. There's no line we can draw and we could have the same um, shape on both sides of that line. And then there's also no point in which the X and the Y's are going to be opposites of one another. So this one is no symmetry. And then this letter D, and do make sure you write the equation and write, uh, draw the graph on your paper because you do need all of these. And then for letter D, it is symmetrical about the point 0, negative 2. Point symmetry because of that 180 degree rotation about that point 0, negative 2. So that's your answer to letter D. And for this last one, we're going to determine whether each function is even, odd, or neither. Confirm algebraically if the function is odd or even. Describe the symmetry. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's look at this point, 0, 0. This dot and this dot are symmetrical about that point.
So this one would have point symmetry. And that would make that an odd function since it has point symmetry. We'll discuss confirming algebraically together in class. Do make sure to write down these graphs and at least write even, odd, or neither with a question mark and then describe the symmetry. Then for this next one, for letter B, you could draw a line of symmetry and the curve on the left side of the graph of my, or excuse me, of my line of symmetry is the same as the curve on the right side. So this has line symmetry and that would make it an even function. Now let's look at letter C. If I use this point and rotated this graph 180 degrees, it does look like point symmetry. And it would be odd. But I will check on that one because surely one of these is neither if that's your answer. So that's, that's how we all operate, right? We think that one of them should be neither. Okay, that's it. I hope you have a great day.